Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Well, we're back to the whiteboard today and we're going to be talking all about banks, debt and money, where currencies derive their value from and the difference between the true economy and the financial economy that's become really distorted these days. So this video is going to build on previous topics we've discussed. If you haven't watched the videos about negative interest rates, uh, the truth about inflation and why asset bubbles have been created by central banks, I will link those down below. All right, so let's get into it. We've got lights on the whiteboard today. So over here, we've got an economy, and this can be uh, any uh, country, for example, and we're going to tie it all together at the end here. So at the top, we've got the government uh, and the central bank. The government spend on things like hospitals and schools. We have people that work in the economy. Down here, we've got real businesses, more people working. Uh, we've got the uh, commercial banks, which lend money off these central banks and they loan to businesses. Those businesses pay people. They pay their tax back to the government. And below, we've got the housing market. These people need somewhere to live. And then we've got the financial economy with stocks and whatnot. Now, the commodities themselves, oil, gold and silver, other resources, they're part of the real economy, but the financial markets and that speculation has become really important to that space, which I'm going to touch on as well. So how does currency flow around a typical economy? Well, it needs to come from somewhere. And central banks are really in control. So they've got those levers of interest rates to make money more easy to, to borrow uh, or more difficult when they jack up interest rates and it's expensive to borrow. And they can also print money. So QE, those things that you've heard of, as well as targeting that normal inflation that they talk about of two or 3% being really healthy in terms of a growing economy. We've then got the government and they need to spend on these things, the public works and infrastructure. So where does the government get their money from? Well, they issue bonds. That's the green thing we've got here. Now, there can be any buyer of these bonds. You know, an average investor can actually buy a bond, but typically, uh, you know, they're purchased by banks, uh, the central bank themselves, and they will lend money and that money turns up in the account of the government. So these days, it's not physical notes uh, and coins, that sort of thing. It's just a, a ledger. Those numbers magically turn up in the computers of the government, and they've got this money now that they've sold bonds. Now, if they spend more than the amount of bonds they've sold or the amount of tax they take in and the revenues they've get, they run deficits. And this is where a lot of governments now are running massive deficits. The US are running a trillion dollar deficit a year and they've already got $23 trillion in debt. And we're gonna to get to why that's really important at the end here. But what's happened of late is that there's this crying out from banks that there's not enough money in the system. You've heard about the repo markets and central banks have had to come in once again and inject money, dollars, into the banks. So they have these dollars uh, and now they can shore up their books and they've got enough reserves to be safe. Now, where this gets really interesting is where does this money actually flow? Does it get into the real economy when we talk about things like QE, which is meant to be stimulating the economy? So we have the government, and they've issued their bonds. A lot of those bonds have been bought by these banks, but we also have businesses and corporations that might issue corporate bonds, this little black bond we've got down here. And this is where junk bonds have become really popular because they pay a high yield because they've got a high risk. And because interest rates are so low, investors are loving those high yields. So they don't really care how risky it is. They're just buying all these bonds. And now we've got a lot of junk bonds in companies that aren't making money. A lot of um, companies in the commodity oil and gas space, they've spent a lot of money on drilling and exploration and now they're not actually making a profit. So at the moment, they're having to keep borrowing more and more money uh, from these banks or issuing more and more junk bonds. And this is where you hear about corporate debt is at record levels. But no one really cares because you know, these central banks are just turning these into financial products that have a high yield and everything's going up and to the right. Everyone's buying at the moment. Everyone's happy because prices are going up. Now, with the repo markets and QE, what happens is the central bank says, we are going to print more money and we're going to buy the toxic assets, the bad assets off you. So they're going to buy these bonds back off these banks or they're going to buy the, the junk bonds back off these banks. And even in some countries now, we've got them buying you know, the mortgage-backed securities or stocks. You know, The Swiss National Bank is now one of the biggest holders of Apple stock. So we've got central banks that are printing money out of thin air 
and they're either buying stocks directly or they're giving this money to these banks. Now, the thought process in economic textbooks is that they will lend this money into the real economy, to businesses, into people, to start new businesses and, and whatnot. But what's actually happening is all this money is just flowing straight through and they are speculating. So recently, JP Morgan announced record profits and yet at the same time, they're saying there's not enough money in the system, that uh, you know we need to print more money, there's not enough money out there for lending and to shore up the banks. But all their money is busy speculating and gambling in the stock market and not doing what banks were originally meant to do, which is you know to create loans and to inject that money into the real economy. So this is where it starts to get really distorted in terms of the money that goes into all these assets for speculation is driving up prices of shares, uh, even commodities to some degree, and, and things like property. Now, when they start to make a lot of money from issuing mortgages, that's one of the causes of the GFC. So these bankers get told, wow, those mortgages, they make a high yield. You know, issue as many mortgages as you can. So then they create those incentives for brokers and they give out mortgages to people that can't afford it. And that's kind of what's happening now in this junk bond market we just discussed. Investors are craving these high yield products and so central banks, are, um, these commercial banks are sort of saying, you know, give us more of those. Let's package those up into CDOs instead of CLOs. So instead of loans, they're collateralized debt obligations now. And investors are just loving them. So they're giving more and more of this money to these companies that can't afford it. They should be going broke. But it doesn't matter because it's all a big game on Wall Street now and everything is going up. So that is the money creation system of one economy there and how it doesn't flow into the real economy. And this is why asset prices we see are going up so much. And I've done the videos about how asset prices are going up between 7 and 10% a year, even though real inflation is reported at about 2% a year. So the top 1%, the fat cats, the guys that are the CEOs, the guys that own all the wealth, all the properties, all the commodities, they are getting richer and richer from this money creation that's being injected, but not getting into the, the real economy. So I hope that makes sense there. And let's let's head over to the chart and, and tie this all together. So any currency, whether it's the US dollar, the Aussie dollar, you know, we can head over to China and look at the yuan or the yen, all these different currencies, when they increase the total value, um, there's only one way they can do that because the, the price, the unit price is pegged to a dollar, for example. So the only way we can increase the total amount is increase the supply, the number of units of currency. That when they print money, you know, you hear about the Fed creating $250 trillion and it's the, the, the price is stable there. Now that is very different when we look at Bitcoin. Now if Bitcoin, when the total value increases, the number of units is fixed or relatively fixed. So I've got an asterisk there because yes, there are some more Bitcoins to be mined, but we know that the total amount is only ever 21 million. Now, a lot of those are lost, so the supply might be closer to say 16 million, we're not really sure. But the point is the supply, the number of units is fixed. It can't go up like in this equation. So the only way the total value of the network, when more people come in, more people start using it, more people see it as a better money because it's digitally scarce, the only way uh, is for price to go up. And that's why we've seen price go up so much. Now, when you think about that in terms of comparatively to everything else that's going on around us, here we've got a chart of the total value uh, and a time scale. So what we see here down the bottom is the average citizen, the average worker. Now, they're being told that inflation is somewhere around 2%, but the reality is that a lot of people haven't seen any wage growth. So I know people out there that haven't had a single wage increase for 10 years. Now, they're being told that inflation is only 2%, but as we've spoken about in videos, the real inflation rate is far closer to 7 or 9%. And that's actually the amount of new money that central banks are creating each year. If you look at things like QE, uh, M2 or M3 money supply, the amount of money that central banks are creating is far closer to 7 or 10% a year. And that's cons consistent for decades and decades. That's not just recently. So when we have a look at the average person in blue down the bottom here, they're going along sideways. Now that's if they don't have debt. So the other problem here that's that sort of dual-edged sword is people that want to borrow money off banks, 
they actually have to do so at a higher interest rate. So at the moment, central banks have set rates at zero or even negative interest rates. So it's very cheap for them to borrow. And the idea of that is once again, to stimulate the economy that they'll lend it out into the real world. But all they've done is you know, buy back their stock or lend it to companies to buy back their stock or speculate themselves as I, as I just spoke about. So when we head over here, the average person that's got their mortgage, you know, their mortgage might be 5% or, or whatever their, their credit card, their late fees, their, their student loan debt, their car loan debt. So that debt is actually a negative um, on their net worth. It's always drawing down out of that any, any value that they're trying to accrue. And it goes up the chain, once again, to the fat cats, the people with all the wealth and the assets they are charging people that positive interest rate so that the money goes up the system uh, towards them. So when we look in the green, let's say this is the total value of all currency around the globe. It's around 100 trillion at the moment. And that has just been increasing and increasing. So what we see here is over time, that gap gets wider and wider. So every year that you don't keep up with inflation or you don't own any of these assets, financial assets, if you're just an average worker who's getting paid in this currency, every year you're getting somewhere between 7 and 9% further and further behind and that's this gap that's represented there. So a lot of people will say, oh, I was thinking about buying a house a few years ago in Sydney when they were $700,000, but now they're a million dollars. So that, that's a big increase, almost 50% in just a few years and that's where we get this number, this 7 to 9% gap that you're getting further and further behind. Now, this is great for those fat caps that own all the assets, all this new money that's being created is going into these assets. So they that have their net worth going up this seven to nine percent. So they're getting wealthier and wealthier. The final piece here I just want to discuss is the uh, the purple line. So that's one quadrillion dollars. And that's all the derivatives and speculation that is happening on Wall Street. So this number has just, just blown out. Once again, that can only happen if all this funny money is being pumped into these markets. And anytime stocks go down, because of all the leverage, this system would normally collapse, but central banks are just injecting more and more money. Uh, once again, that sort of gets sucked out and into the pockets of the wealthy. So when you have a look at that gap, it's even even bigger again. Now, this is where Bitcoin comes into the equation and it's really important. If this person here down the bottom that is going along sideways or even negative and losing uh, their net value or purchasing power, if they decide to hold any worth um, wealth they've got in, in Bitcoin, the only way that um, that value of that network can keep growing up is, is the price going up. So if they own a fixed amount of dollars, a, a, a portion of the units, that currency supply, every year they're being diluted because 7 to 9% more is being created. Whereas with Bitcoin, they own the same amount of that system. They're not being diluted. So every year over time on average, their value, their net worth is going up and up. Now that's just on a relative scale if all else remains equal. But obviously what we've seen is more people investing in Bitcoin, uh, speculating on Bitcoin, using Bitcoin in the real world. So when you look at the market cap of currently, let's say 100 billion using a round number, comparing that to 100 trillion or one quadrillion of derivatives, Bitcoin is still, you know, one one thousandth. So there's so much room for, for growth. You know, we could have 10 times as many people come in and use this system. And globally, Bitcoin adoption might only be 0.1%. So even if we have 10 times as many people, that's only 1% penetration. And that would give us a, you know, a trillion dollar market cap. Well, what happens if 10% of people decide that this is a better currency store of value than, than current money? Well, then we'd have a $10 trillion market cap. What happens when 99% of people realize that this system is better for them? They are being left behind to a far lesser degree than this system that benefits the fat cats, that only benefits the top 1% or 0.1%. So all of a sudden, we might have 99.9% .9 of people that decide, hey, this is a better currency. I'm not going to be diluted. They can't just keep creating more and more units to pay off the debts that have gone from billions to trillions to quadrillions. This is why the value of Bitcoin has gone from millions to billions to I think it is going to hit over a trillion dollar market cap. So this total value can only come from these governments and central banks printing more and more of this currency. And every day, more people are educating themselves on this system, which is fairer for them.
Now that's just relative to one economy and this is the final piece that's going to tie it all together and I hope you really understand these concepts. If we say that this economy here is Australia, the Aussie dollar for example, they haven't been printing much money of late, they haven't done the QE, so their money supply might have stayed relatively stable. Now the ECB have been doing QE for years, so you know they're printing more. The United States did those bailouts and, and QE, so they've printed a lot of currency there. What about down in Japan? You know, they've been printing trillions of yen for years and years. Over in China the other day, they're injecting more capital. So all these different countries are just printing more money. And if Bitcoin just holds its own, that piece of the pie, the value is going to go up because it's denominated in all these currencies. That's why we see Bitcoin at record highs in places like Venezuela and in Zimbabwe because they've just printed you know, crazy, crazy, crazy amounts of dollars and it's just diluting that money uh, and pushing up the price of anything, commodities or Bitcoin that's priced in that local fiat currency. So where we get to these currency wars and trade wars, which I don't think is being discussed, discussed enough at the moment, is that these different economies are buying resources of each other. We've heard about globalization and now people are getting a little bit shy about that and saying, well, is that the best the best way to go about things? Or do we need to protect our own resources and protect our own jobs? So let's take China, for example, a big trading partner with Australia. What happens when they want to buy more oil off us or buy some water or other commodities? You know, our gold and silver, they're big buyers of those types of things. Australia go, yeah, that's great. And they're being paid in this currency. But we don't know if China are just printing as much as they need to buy all our assets. And so we're sort of sitting there, our government's being paid, our businesses are being paid in this fiat currency. So in theory, when one country prints a lot of money, it's the job of the forex markets, the investors, to, to balance that currency and the value will go down if they're printing more. But there's no truth, transparency, and, and trust. We don't really know how much money one country is printing over another. So that you know the US talks about you know, how much gold is in Fort Knox and whatnot, but there's just no transparency these days around who's got what assets, commodities, how much money anyone is printing. So I think this is where things are going to heat up. People are no longer just going to give away their commodities and their land and their water to these other countries that are just printing fiat currency, but in particular the US. They've had this world reserve status, their central bank has become globally powerful, there's global demand for US dollars because all these countries and their economies have got debts from their banks that are issued in US dollars. So at the moment there's a big demand for US dollars and it's pushing up the price at a time when there's $250 trillion of debt. So that all that debt needs to be paid back eventually. That means the US Central Bank has to create $250 trillion at some point or another. All of a sudden, that's making Bitcoin look like a really great option if you know that there's going to be $250 trillion. They're going to dilute with more and more units and more supply. Why not sit in this, the, the asset, the currency that's fixed? So I hope that all makes sense. Really important to understand a few of these concepts. We've now got governments talking about modern monetary theory where it doesn't even matter about selling these bonds and getting money off the central banks. They're just going to start printing money and spending on things and getting that infrastructure going. So firstly, that, that risks inflation and we get that runaway inflation in like places uh, like Zimbabwe and Venezuela and whatnot. But it's again, just, just another factor that creates more of these currency units diluting the supply of whatever little money you have, uh, increasing the total value that accrues to those with all the assets, you get further and further behind unless you are sitting in an asset like gold or Bitcoin or something that is relatively scarce. So I hope that all makes sense. I hope you guys have enjoyed that video. If you want more of this sort of content, head over to nuggetsnews.com.au where I do these updates daily for our members. Otherwise, smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share this video around, and I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers.